Welcome back to Let's Code Games. It's been two years since I did the Zelda series and I've been getting amazing feedback from all of you and awesome messages on Twitter and YouTube and via email that you want to have more. So I really want to try to do more on Let's Code Games. So we're starting with this experiment. This is just a very small game. It'll take three videos, which we upload on each Friday and we'll see where this goes. Please leave us feedback on what you want to see and what you like and what you don't like so we can make this channel amazing. All right, let's make a little racer game. So we have set up the scene already. So we have a background and a racing track. So we can just start with the game itself. We're setting up a car here, the player car. And the goal of this game basically is just to race around in a circle and keep, keep track of the time, stuff like that. So whenever I set up game objects, I do um, I I have this uh, this base structure that I always use. So I have the main object, which all the the script and the behavior is attached to. Then I have a child object called visuals, and and all the graphics and and stuff like that are always attached to the child object visuals. And the goal here is that I have the the behavior and the visuals separated from each other. And you will always also see that later on in the, the, the way we structure the code here. It's, it's always good to have the visuals separated because then we can do stuff later, for example, to make this car flip when it uh, slips over an oil spill without having to affect the actual model. So this is cool for effects and stuff like that. So you can, you can affect the visual model without affecting the actual game model and physics and stuff like that. Okay, so we, we're setting up some basic stuff here. So this is going to be a physics-driven game. So we have a rigid body and a collider attached to, to the main object. And we also created a script called car movement, which will handle all the, all the forces like moving forward and stuff like that. So when you have physics-based objects, the difference between a collider and a rigid body is that the collider defines the shape of the object and the rigid body contains all the forces um, and calculates stuff like that. So that's that's how you can think of in, um, what the difference between a collider and a rigid body is. Okay, so in the car movement class, we first get a reference to our rigid body. Um, our intention is that this script is on the same object as the rigid body. So we can do stuff like get component and then have rigid body at angular brackets to get a reference to that component. And this way we can Using the mBody variable, we can later on apply forces to, to the rigid body and stuff like that. We define a public variable, maximum engine force, um, just so we have some way to, to modify how much force we actually put into the system. So we can, we can modify the speed of the object and stuff like that. So I always have public variables. Um, just I just name them what they are, just like maximum engine force. And then the, the private variables, I always have m underscore. And the reason for that is just so that I know the separation when encoding. m underscore um, stands for a member variable. In C sharp, that is a pretty common, common way to define your uh, com common naming convention. So we have the maximum en engine force, which is a public variable. And since it's public, um, when we click on the object there, you can see in the car movement uh, script in the in the inspector, we have a, a way to to set that value there now, just because it's public, and that's something that Unity does for us. So you can see here we, we we're playing around with the force a little bit, getting a hang of how much force do we actually need. But you will actually see that I made a mistake here, uh, and I apply the force forward, which in two D is actually towards the screen, um, which um. But since we're working in 2D here, we basically we have up, down, and left, right as, as the two main axes. Um, so that's what I'm realizing here. And that's so why I, I basically I apply the force uh, to the transform up vector of the component. So where, wherever the, the object is facing up, um, I want to apply the force to. And now you can see once I apply the forces, and I do apply them continually here, like every frame I apply the force, the, the car starts to move forward. And I'm just, just playing around with the variables a little bit, uh, getting a hang of, um, of, the, uh, of the values and stuff like that. And when you work with physics, it's always better to think in terms of forces than 
stuff like maximum speed, for example. So that's why I call this variable maximum engine force, because that's actually the force that we put, put into the system, but it it is being counteracted by, for example, the linear drag, which is linear drag is basically just whenever you have a force and you like an object moving and you don't have any drag, um, that would be kind of like in a vacuum, like in space, right? So you put force into the system, it starts moving and it will never stop. But having linear drag means when there's movement, you will always have like a little bit of force in the exact opposite direction. So it starts to slow down. So the maximum, en uh, maximum engine force, which we apply here every frame forward, works together with a drag to 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 make up the maximum speed. So we don't actually have a maximum speed value. It's a combination of the force we put in and the drag that is upon the rigid body. The reason why we have some drag is because um, the, the faster, uh, the higher the drag is, the faster the car will stop again uh, once there's force in there. And that actually makes a difference for the, for the turning later as well, because when you have force in this direction and it's not stopping and you start to turn, you will still go in the same direction. So even though even though the force will be in the other direction because it will always be up, right? It will still go in that direction and then slowly turn over, um, because the the initial direction force will will not be cancelled out. But since we have drag, the the car will will um, will turn much much smoother and stuff like that. And so and then we we start to play with these forces a little bit, see um, see what feels best. And especially for physics games, that's something that you have to do a lot. Just Put in some forces, give yourself some, some values, like public values, so you can have angular angular speed and, and stuff like that. And then play around with those values and make sure they, they feel just right. So what we do here now is we have a second class called car input base. And the goal here is to have a separate class for the input and the actual movement. And that's, all, uh, that's called uh, like a model view controller pattern. The goal here is to separate the model, which is the, the physics model. And, and, uh, and don't think model in terms of like 3D model, stuff like that. It's like a simulation model, like your code base, like the forces and stuff like that. They all, they, they all are part of the model. Everything that, that changes the state of the object is, is part of the model. And then you have the controller class, which acts upon that model and tells the model, in this case, we start with steering. So it tells the model steer left and steer right. The good part about separating those is uh, that later on you can vary very easily. So now we, we created like a base class. Let me start there, like a base class for the input. And that is the interface. The base class defines how we talk to the model. And then we inherit a keyboard class from that and we create a key keyboard class that extends the base class of the input and basically just uh, capture the keyboard, uh, keyboard input and pass that along to the model. The, uh, so you can see here now uh, the, the movements, uh, the forces are not quite set up right yet, so we're spinning out of control uh, very, very quickly. But it's it's working quite quite nicely already, and and we we can start to play with those values and and, and have input control there. Since we have we're, we're defining the keyboard input class now, it is very simple later on to just remove that and, for example, create a controller input class, put that on there, and then you have a different input method without having the the worry that you change any of your code or introduce bugs in, in there. Because sometimes um, you just, um, if you want to, especially want to do something quickly or if you don't plan it out uh, as much, you create this one huge class and then put everything in there, like the input um, and, and then, so basically in that classes, if you press W, then apply forward force and stuff like that. Which makes it very hard later on to remove all that input code and put in different input code for touch input or, key, uh, or, or gamepad input. And since we're separating that out, having the input in a very separate class, we, we can very easily change that out later without actually affecting the game code. And that's something you always have to think about in terms of the components that Unity have. And that's, what, uh, that's what's so great about this component system. Try to separate out the components in such a way that, that they that they logically just are, are one unit and then affect each other. But it makes it easier for you if you have smaller components to remove a comp 
comp com component completely uh, and uh, change it out with with something else. So, okay, so we have the keyboard input uh, in there, uh, and we're playing around with the with the engine force and the uh, and the steering is, uh, stuff, and just again playing with those values and seeing what feels right. And the, and the car still feels a little floaty, which is often a problem. Um, it just doesn't, the, the controls don't feel that like tight. And if you, uh, if you press the key, it doesn't affect the, the outcome immediately and stuff like that. So that's something, you, especially in the physics game, you have to have to be very mindful of. Yeah, so this is a little slow. Let's get get a little faster here and stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. So um, let's talk about the base class that we created. This is something that I do very, very often. I create a, like a car input base class, so car movement. In this case, I know it's a simple game, so car movement is is just this car movement class. But usually in a in a more advanced game, I usually have like a, a movement base class as well, um, and then and have different movement types um, um, extend from that. And the goal here is uh, with a base class to make sure that you have a common, well, you can call it interface. There's something called an interface in C-sharp, but it's, it's like you have a common way to access uh, or to work with those classes. For example, with, key, uh, with input base, we have the, we define the way how we, we, talk to the the model the movement model um, and then you can extend from that and just use use the functions that you defined in your base class to talk to all the other classes this way it's again easier to switch out the components later if you want to have different variations of the components um, make sure that you just define the way you talk to other classes in the base class and then have the specifics uh, specific implementations in the in the other classes as well so what I'm doing here now is I'm, I'm changing I'm changing the pivot of the of the car uh, a little bit of the visuals, because in the beginning we had the pivot in the very center, so the car was uh, was turning around the center. But that's not really how a car turns, right? You have the steering wheels uh, in the front, and then it uh, it turns around that axis. Um, so in order to achieve that, we we do a couple of different things here. First of all, we we set the um, um, the, the the visuals a little bit backward uh, and then we we made sure that the collider is again just moved backwards as well so it's still uh, it's still describing the the car correctly and yeah and now the the car is turning around the the front part of the car right and and it it feels much more like like a real car would actually turn in right that actually starts to feel quite nicely So the next thing that we put in here is, is, is that we can actually move forward and stuff. We still have the continual forward force applied. So we want to be able to, to accelerate and decelerate, brake and stuff like that. First of all, we define a function set engine force, which then the, the input class can call to, to modify the, the actual input that we have. So I want to have different values for the for forward and backward forces, um, which I'm, I'm doing here. Um, and I'm playing around with a few different ideas. Like right now I'm thinking maybe I can have the reverse power like a fraction, a modifier of the maximum engine force. So whenever I define the maximum, uh, change the maximum engine force, the reverse force gets changed as well. But I uh, ended up not liking that idea. So I put in a maximum engine force and a ma maximum reverse force. And so, Okay, so the steering the set steering direction accept a float value. Basically, uh, you can put in a value between negative one and one. So one is maximum forward force and negative one is maximum reverse force. In the function apply engine force, where I actually apply that force, I check if I'm going forward or backwards, depending on the input. And if I'm going backwards, I actually take the maximum reverse force as, as a multiplier instead of the maximum forward force. And this way we can have two different values and can um, and can adjust them independently, the forward and the backwards force. 
Okay, so for the input now, I also define a protected set engine force and the protected um, methods here are designed to being called by the actual implementations like the keyword implementation or the or the or the um, controller implementation of, of the input classes. And so the base class then makes sure we, we correctly talk to the model. And this way we also we we separating again code where we actually talk to the model and uh, and where we define our intentions. So in the actual keyword class, we can just say, okay, put forward, put uh, like, like just define the value and get it from 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 somewhere like in, in this case, the the keyword input and don't care about how we need to talk to that model. Because maybe we put the touch code in much, much later, like a year after you you design that code and you want to make a mobile game now. You don't have to learn again how you have to talk to the model. You simply use that interface that you defined in the base class. And now we can go forward and backwards um, by pressing W and S here. And we're using the Unity input class, uh, which is very handy, especially for small games. It already has the vertical and horizontal axis set up for you. And it has it set up to WASD or alternatively the, the arrow keys. So you can use both. So the horizontal axis is A and D uh, to go left and right, and the vertical axis is up and down, so W and S. So, and by using input.getAxis, we get, again, a value between 0 and 1, depending on what we're pressing. And getting these 0 and 1 negative, no, 0 and 1 or like negative 1 and 1 values is very handy to think like all the, to think about in terms of negative one and one and values in between. The benefit of thinking about that is the underlying way you you talk to um, the model um, is doesn't depend on any units and stuff. You could like, uh, you could say, if I press forward, put the engine force to 200. Um, but then again, you have to think about, you have like, model code in the input code, right? You set this to 200 and where's this 200 coming from? And, and now that's uh, like mixed with the input. And whenever you change the 200 value in, in the keyboard class, you have to change it in other classes as well and stuff like that. But by thinking about negative one and one, you're basically just saying maximum backwards or maximum forwards. So zero is basically nothing. One is the maximum. And then you have all the values in between. And then you can say basically, okay, from the input class, you can say to the movement class, um, go forward with uh, with fifty percent force, like, and you just pass on the zero point five, and you don't by just passing on the zero point five, you don't care about the values, uh, the units, the actual force that you put in. You're just saying give me half the force, which is very handy. So always, always think about you, um, and always try to use uh, values from zero point one if you define ranges and then just in the very very end you put in the the force multipliers you say okay if this is maximum force now i add in what uh, what we, we have now maximum force is at ten thousand. so now i add in the ten thousand units of force whatever but throughout the whole model the whole communication chain between the input and the model you always just think in terms of negative one zero one and the values in between which makes it much easier because uh, right now we basically um, um, we we changed uh, we changed the the input code uh, the movement code a little bit to to accept the 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 input value as a target value, and then slowly move towards that value, which makes us uh, which makes it easier for us to have stuff like acceleration and stuff. We have more control over the acceleration and stuff like that. So we play around with this a little bit, but the refactoring that we do that uh, here is uh, something that happens very, very often. You start off with some kind of code uh, and some kind of idea that you want to do, and then um, just implement that as quickly as possible. And then you come up with new ideas, think in terms of what you can do better and stuff like that. So you start to refactor, add in new variables, change stuff around a little bit. And it's much easier to do that if you separate your code into logical units. If you have a well-defined interface, it's very easy to change one bit and you don't have to change all the other bits to fit, which, which, is, uh, which is very, very useful.
Okay, so now we have some steering. Uh, we have um, we have the this uh, the steering torque that we can set up, which is the rotational force that we put into the car. So how fast we can steer and stuff like that. And this again is in relation to the angular drag and stuff. Uh, so uh, when you think when you do a physics game, it's always in terms of forces um, and how they relate to each other. Yeah. So now we have like a very basic movement here. Um, the car can can turn. You can we can go forwards and backwards, drive around the a circle and stuff like that. So we have a very basic physics movement set up, and it feels really really good. So in the next episode, let's uh, let's start to um, think about in terms of collisions and stuff like that. Let's uh, talk about that. How we can uh, change it so that uh, we can't just drive off the course. Okay. So I hope you you like this, and see you next week for the next episode.